Let me lead us in prayer as we start. Father, we thank you so much that you are the God of glory. A God whose glory shines out, who loves to make himself known to us. And so we pray that this weekend for the next three weeks, you would help us to be people who rightly understand what exactly that means and how that works for us, that we might truly be people who can behold you in all of your glory and be transformed ourselves into that glory. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, for those of you who were on our weekend together, I guess just last weekend, unless you're listening to this later on, uh, you will remember Matt Fuller speaking to us from Isaiah chapter 40 and exhorting us in keeping with Isaiah chapter 40 to gaze on God. Behold your God, he said, as he preached those words to us. And he did it because, of course, in Isaiah chapter 40, it says there that the glory of God will be revealed to all of the nations. And then just a few verses later, Isaiah says as a consequence, behold your God. And as Matt spoke and as we read those words, I thought to myself, it sounds like such a such an attractive prospect, doesn't it? I want to be able to see the glory of God. I want to be able to behold my God. And I don't think that's just me. I suspect that's probably you as well, and I suspect it's probably almost anyone. Uh, Anyone wants to be able to see God and know God and gaze on God, if that was possible. I remember a few years ago, I was on uh, on the tube, and I just picked up a newspaper that was lying around and opened it up and went past the advert section of it, but stopped for a moment because there, in one of the adverts, was a picture of a beautiful country house. And the advert was for a weekend retreat uh, that was promising to enable you to connect with God. It wasn't Christian at all. It was just a, I don't know what religion or worldview it was. It was just an advert there for a weekend retreat. Come and get to know God, connect with God. And it was so striking there in a secular newspaper, a publication, as an advert And I thought to myself, I bet there will be people, lots of people who will sign up for that weekend away because they want to go and get to know God. If there's a God out there, we want to know him. We want to hear from him. We want to see him. Uh, Again, I remember a few years ago on YouTube, a particular clip went viral. It was a trip from a church in California who were claiming that the glory cloud of God had descended on their church and on the YouTube clip that you sort of had the, the pastor at the front, he pointed to the top corner of the room and, and up there was a sort of swirly gold cloud of some sorts. And this clip went viral because all of a sudden people were saying there in California is this church where you can go and gaze on the glory of God. The glory of God has descended upon that church. And it went viral because people wanted to see it. And people flocked from all over the world to, to see that church and to enjoy the ministry of that church because it's such an attractive prospect. I want to behold God, you want to behold God. The question is, how? How do we do it? Well, the next three Sunday evenings are going to be spent thinking about exactly that. How do we gaze on God? How do we behold his glory? It's mean, to get the best out of this, you're going to need to commit to at least the next three Sunday evenings. Or if you're listening afterwards to downloading and taking in these talks, because they will work together as a piece. But as we start, let me say up front that as we think about getting to know God, we need to know that he is not a God who is hiding from us. I think sometimes we can fall into the trap of thinking that God is a bit like a a, a kind of hermit hiding in the hills somewhere. This shadowy figure who appears every once in a while in the village, but then retreats back up to the hills to, to, to exist in glorious isolation. We can think of God as being a bit like that, that. The spiritual equivalent, if you like, of, of, of the Yeti or Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster. You know, you kind of have a sense he might be out there, but only one or two people have ever only really seen him. And day to day life is not spent seeing God, knowing God, beholding God's. But the Bible says, you know what? The opposite is the case. The God of the Bible, the Christian gods, is a God who loves to be known. He is the God whose glory shines out. The main way that we get to know someone is by hearing them talk. 
mean, that's just, just normal human ways of relationship that you listen to someone and get to know them and understand them. Well, the same is true, of course, with God. And God is a God who loves to talk. Uh, even the very act of creation, the beginning of everything, the world, the stars, the universe. The Bible says that that was done through God speaking. I mean, you know that from Genesis chapter one. He said, let there be light and there was light. But the Psalms make exactly the same point. Psalm 33 verse, uh, verse six says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. He spoke and it came to be. Even the creation comes about because God speaks. But more than that, The creation itself speaks because God has set it up that way. So Psalm 19 verse 1 that we looked at a couple of weeks ago in the evening. Psalm 19 verse 1 says the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Or Romans chapter 1 verse 20. Paul writes God's invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. The things that have been made, that's everything by the way, they proclaim, they speak powerfully of God's, his attributes, his power, his divine nature. It's why, for example, when you go Uh, out to the countryside and take in a majestic view your jaw drops Uh, things like the Grand Canyon or the uh, the the photographs that we get through the Hubble telescope they leave us with a sense of awe and majesty even atheists take in views like that or see things like that and start to talk in heightened terms of awe and majesty and and wonder it's impossible to look through the Hubble telescope and just walk away and say just an accident, because the Bible says those things are screaming at you. They are saying to you, God is majestic and he is powerful and he is glorious. His grandeur is proclaimed by the creation itself. It's speaking, as it were, on his behalf because he set it up in that way. But the Bible says that you and I are experts at suppressing that truth about God. The creation screams of his glory, but we are good at putting our hands over our ears and saying, la, 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 I can't hear you. And we either deny the existence of God or we create a new kind of God to worship rather than worshiping the God who is truly revealed in the creation. But that doesn't stop God. He's not that easily stopped. And the story of the Bible, really, from Genesis chapter three on, is the story of God breaking in. It's the story of God saying, I won't be suppressed. I won't have my glory pushed down. I will have my glory made known to anyone and everyone. It's, uh, if you like, as though God is like the sun. Uh, You know, in the middle of the night, I can turn a torch on in the garden and it might just make the back wall or, you know, kind of uh, just one corner of it. But it won't illuminate everything. But when the sun rises, it gets everywhere. Uh, There are no dark places left when the daylight comes. God is like the sun rising. He says, my glory will be made known to all of the nations And a key moment in the development of that idea is the book of Exodus, a book that starts with God saying, I will make myself known to all of the nations. I will manifest my glory. And it's as though in the book of Exodus, God says to Moses and the people of Israel and us as readers, he said, just watch, just just watch for a little while. Uh, You're going to get to know me by what I do in this instance. And in the book of Exodus, you see amazing miracles happening uh, again and again and again, miracles that speak of God's power, but also of his grace in salvation as he rescues the people uh, from Egypt and slavery therein. God saying, just watch me, you'll get to know me by what I do. It's an amazing act of revelation on his part as his glory shines out. But there's a key moment in Exodus chapter 33 and 34. We're going to read from them in a moment. So if you've got a Bible, grab that and turn to it. Where Moses has a private meeting with God. And he says to him, God, I want you to show me your glory. 
show me your glory. It's the same question that, that we're asking. I want to behold you. I want to gaze on you. I want to know you fully. Lord, don't hold back. Show me everything. And in Exodus chapter 34, God says, I'll do that. I'll show you my glory. And Rich is going to read that for us now. The reading is from Exodus chapter 33, verse 17, to chapter 34, verse 9. That's Exodus chapter 33, verse 17, to chapter 34, verse 9. And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favour in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. The Lord said to Moses, Cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Be ready by the morning, and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai, and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you, and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning, and went up on Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud, and stood within there, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children, to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. And he said, if now I have found favour in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. Uh, verse 18 is the key moment. Uh, what you wouldn't give to, to, to be Moses and to be able to ask the question that he asks. Did you see it? Chapter three, uh, 33, verse 18. Moses said, please, Show me your glory. Lord, that, that's what all of us want. We want to see your glory. So what is the answer that God gives to Moses' question? You see verse 19? He said, I will. I will. Now, what are you expecting at this moment? When God says, I will do this, I, the thing you're asking for, I'll do it. He says, I will. Well, he goes on. He says, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. Moses says, show me your glory. And God says, I will. I'll proclaim to you my name. And the second half of verse 19 is just a snippet of exactly that. He says, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But the climactic moment, the moment of truth comes in chapter 34. In verse six, everything is set. Moses is on top of the mountain. He's in the position that God has told him to be in. And we're going to get the revelation of God's glory. And so what happens? Verse six, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed. 
the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children, the third and the fourth generation. Moses says, show me your glory. God says, I'll do exactly that. I'll proclaim to you my name. And of course, his name, Yahweh, literally means I am who I am. He says, I'll tell you my name. I'll tell you about myself. I'll tell you about my character, my essence. If you asked uh, Usain Bolt uh, to show us his glory, he'd point you to photos of the Beijing Olympics in 2008 as he set that world record sprinting 100 metres. If you said to Serena Williams, show us your glory, she'd probably point to a trophy cabinet laden with all the grand slams. She said to Lin-Manuel Miranda, uh, show us your glory, he'd point us to the stage musical Hamilton. We could go on and on and on. When you say to God, show me your glory, he says, I'm going to tell you about my character. You want to know what's the most inherently glorious thing about me? It's who I am. And this list of characteristics in verse six and seven, grace and mercy and love and justice, these are what make God truly glorious. And this is what he wants us to know about him. He says, that's my glory. That's what I want you to know. That's what I want you to be most excited about. In the Christian life, it's so easy to get excited about all kinds of different things. Uh, we hear about an event over there or a happening over there or a, a cloud appearing in a building in California over there. And God says, no, look, look th th when I reveal my glory to you, it's going to be my character that's revealed, that's displayed for everybody to see. In the end, I don't want you to know about happening here or happening there. I want you to know about me and my essential character. And the rest of the Bible story from this moment on is like a, a stage, as it were, laid out for God to do exactly that, to reveal his glory. And the Bible story is event after event and episode after episode, uh, a speech after speech of God just showing who he is and what he's like. The grand stage of human history plays out in front of us so that we can get to know God and his glory, just how good and wonderful and majestic he is. All of it screaming all the time, God is glorious, God is glorious. But this, uh, this stage play, as it were, this musical, as it were, this, uh, this story of the glory of God's, is a story that has a grand climax to it. It has a grand crescendo because in the end, this God is a God whose glory is seen in Jesus. Do you remember the first words of John's Gospel? Uh, as a, if you're in a small group this year, you've been in John, but it might be a while ago you read those words. Just if, if you've got a Bible in front of you, turn to John chapter one, verse one, and see if as you do that, you can remember the opening words of those uh, of the of the gospel. John writes there famously, he says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And when you read on, it becomes obvious that as he's talking about the word, he's talking about Jesus Christ. Such a powerful description of him and gives us a very strong clue about what he's like, what he's about. He's the word. He's God's speech about himself. He's God's revelation about himself. Someone once said, um, Jesus is God introducing himself, which is a great way of thinking about it. But when you meet Jesus... What do you discover about him? Well, verse 14 of John chapter one tells us, as the apostles have met Jesus, they say, verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. 
You see, everything God said about himself in uh, Exodus chapter 34, Jesus <clears throat> reveals fully and finally. God says, if you want to see my glory like Moses did all of those years ago, all you need to do is look at Jesus Christ. And reflecting on the story of the Old Testament, remember we, we said that stage that is laid out for God to reveal himself on over all of those years. Well, in John chapter five, just flick on to that. John chapter five, verse 39, Jesus says to some Pharisees, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It's they that bear witness about me. That whole Old Testament story revealing the glory of God was all in the end pointing towards Jesus Christ. And when Jesus speaks, he says, look, everything you need to know now, there's nothing more to know. It's all known in me. He says, John chapter 14, verse nine, whoever has seen me has seen the father. So powerful, isn't it? I want to gaze on the glory of God. God says, just gaze on the glory of Jesus Christ. That's where you'll see me. That's how you'll know me. It's put differently in Hebrews chapter one, verse one. Don't turn there now, but you can look it up later. There it says, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets. That's through the Old Testament. But then he says, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. God says, you wanted the answer to Moses' question? Look at Jesus Christ. He is where you will see my glory fully displayed. You remember Serena Williams with her trophy cabinet to show you her glory? It's as though the trophy cabinet of God is opened up and, well, there is Jesus Christ displaying the full, uh, uh, the full glory of God. Which means for you and I, we must never get tired of looking at Jesus Christ and of getting to know him as well as we can. If you want, we must get good at sunbathing, uh, S-O-N, bathing. Just absorbing the glory of God manifested in Jesus Christ. When we open our Bibles on Monday morning, it's a treasure hunt as we search for Jesus Christ on the pages of the scriptures, uh, like he says we will. And as we open that Bible, we should imagine ourselves opening something that, that suddenly the light shines out from, because it's a full revelation of Jesus Christ. As we pray before we open the Bible, we should pray, Lord, show me your glory in Jesus Christ on the pages of the scriptures. As we walk through our days, we should get good at walking through our days, conscious of the presence of Jesus Christ with us by the Holy Spirit in a way that brings our mind to him, helps us to follow in his footsteps, help us to remember the grace that's manifested in him, help us to live according to the example that he shows us again and again, just enjoying and reflecting on Jesus Christ, because that's how we know God. When we meet someone for the first time, uh, we tend to, you know, Oh, maybe in the next few weeks we'll shake hands again and that kind of thing. That's what you used to do. You shake hands or you might, I don't know, whatever, however you do it. Uh, and normally, or it would be or it would be very unusual, wouldn't it, if you shook someone's hand and said, hello, so-and-so, nice to meet you. Uh, tell me about myself. Yeah, they, they, that would be rude, wouldn't it? It would be an odd thing to do. Tell me about myself. No, we say, tell me about yourself. Well, in the Christian life, we, we, we often start with Jesus Christ. It's how we come into the Christian life. But we get good at saying to God, God, tell me about myself. Uh, we want to hear from him about what our life is going to be like. We want to hear from him with answers about decisions that we've got to take. Little snippets here and there that are all about us. When God says, I just want to tell you about myself. I want you to know me. And in our best moments, we know that that is exactly what we need. Instead, we should go to God and say, God, tell me about yourself. And as we do, he will say back to us, let me show you Jesus. He's everything, everything you need to know about me and my glory. And in John's gospel, he says there's a particular moment where the glory of God will shine out most powerfully of all. And in our last few minutes, we're going to have a reading from John chapter 12 to show us exactly that. The reading is from John chapter 12, verses 20 to 28. That's John chapter 12, verses 20 to 28. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. 
So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered him, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honour him. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Did you see how Jesus himself, uh, the, the word of God, says that the moment the glory is going to be revealed is at the cross? It's right there in verse 23. Uh, John 12, verse 23, Jesus answered them, the hour has come, and the hour in John's gospel points forward to the cross. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And then he begins to, to, to pick up this illustration of the seed falling into the ground and dying in order that it might give life. He's speaking, of course, about his death. He is the seed who needs to die in order that there might be life, eternal life for all who trust in Jesus Christ. And then the, the, the thought comes to a climax in verse 29. Uh, sorry, verse 28. He says, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. If you want to see the glory of God manifested most powerfully, so distilled as it were, and then revealed, if you want to see the lights turned up full on the glory of God, well, Jesus says, look at the cross. Look at the cross where I gave up my life which is very counterintuitive, isn't it? It might be something that we're familiar with. It might not be. I don't know, but it's very counterintuitive whether or not it's familiar. Because when we think of glory, we think of power, whereas the cross speaks of weakness. When we think of glory, we think of beauty, whereas the cross is an inherently ugly thing. When we think of glory, we think of exaltation, whereas the cross, of course, speaks of extreme degradation. But that tells us everything we need to know about the glory of God as it's revealed and as it's manifest in the world, because the glory of God, we know this already from tonight, it's not first and foremost about exaltation and beauty and, uh, and power. It is, of course, fundamentally in the end about all of those things, but there's a route to those things through the cross because actually the glory of God is about grace and forgiveness and mercy and steadfast love. That's Exodus 34, isn't it? This is the essence of who God is. He is all of those things, grace, mercy, steadfast love and justice. And the cross of Jesus Christ is, of course, the perfect fusion of all of those things. As you look at the cross of Jesus Christ, you see how he is able to be just. God is perfectly just. Sin is punished. And at the same time, he can be perfectly gracious. He can pour out his abundant love because of the cross. And it is, of course, a supreme demonstration of steadfast love that works its way out in forgiveness. The character of God is perfectly expressed in and through the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus says, if you want to see God's glory, look at the cross. That's where you'll see God's glory most perfectly demonstrated. And so here's three thoughts as we closed. First of all, let's remember that the glory of God is a counterintuitive glory. Uh, John Piper has written a book called Pe God, uh, Pe Peculiar Glory, which is a peculiar uh, title for a book, but nonetheless makes the point that the glory of God is not like the glory that, that man seeks. 
It's different in that respect. It's counterintuitive. We go looking for strength and power and beauty. And of course, those things are there in the cross, but only if you've got eyes to see them. Because God's glory is demonstrated in him bringing himself low and in him humbling himself and and serving others so that he might show these things. This is the way the glory of God works. And it's a really good thing. This is the second observation. Let's see that actually, even though it's counterintuitive, it's actually very, very beautiful and very, very good. We could, if we weren't careful, shy away from the cross. And people have done that down through the years, marginalised it as a reality, been embarrassed of it. And we know that instinct, I think, when we get into conversations with our friends and neighbours to start talking about the death of Jesus as the thing that we want them to hear about most to start to explain to them how the cross works in being their salvation. We can shy away from those things and be embarrassed of them. But actually, we need to realise that they are very, very good because there God is manifest in all his glory in a way that's compelling. Uh, You and I love mercy. We love grace. We love service when we see it. And whilst at first we shy away, in the end, it is what draws us in. This glory is like the light bulb to the moth. With spiritual eyes to see it, we're drawn in to it and we should be unembarrassed of it. And then thirdly, let's never therefore grow tired of gazing on this glory. Jesus Christ the cross of Jesus Christ. These aren't just Sunday school truths that we take on once a long time ago and then move on to more sophisticated realities. This is where we gaze on the glory of God. And every time we come back to him and every time we come back to it, we're getting a fresh glimpse of the glory of God that we love to gaze on. Never grow tired of gazing on the glory of God in the cross of Jesus Christ. But here's a question as we close. Let's think of this as a a teaser towards next week. You might be thinking to yourself, how do I do that? After all, Jesus died on the cross 2000 years ago. How can I gaze on something that happened in history 2000 years ago? And and what's the experience of that actually going to be like? Is it going to be the life transforming experience that I so hope that it will be? Well, to get the answer to that question, you're going to have to come back next Sunday evening. Let me lead us in prayer. Father, we thank you that you're glorious, that you're so magnificent, that you're so majestic, that in the end, actually, there is a beauty and a power and an exaltation in the cross of Jesus Christ that is compelling. And we ask, Father, that you would help us, therefore, to be people who gaze on that glory, who behold our gods and who receive the life that comes from it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 